Hey there, I'm Mike Gillette, your host, and this is 1937 Part 1 of the Soundscape series, Episode 30 of When Radio Ruled. This podcast is a montage of excerpts from old-time radio shows, broadcast January 1 to January 6, 1937, starring Eddie Cantor, Cecil B. DeMille, George Burns, Gracie Ammon, Jack Benny, Phil Harris, Mary Livingston, Kenny Baker, Don Wilson, Al Jolson, Harry Von Zell, Jimmy Wallington, Edith Head, the opening day of the 75th Congress of the United States, Tony Martin, Dinah Shore, and more. These soundscapes are a result of the research phase of the When Radio Ruled historical documentary series. In order to find the best old-time radio excerpts to explain the essence of the era, I listened to hundreds of hours of old-time radio broadcasts, looking for the most interesting bits. For the two documentaries about 1937, I listened to almost 150 hours of recorded past. When I hear something outstanding, a song or a joke or a comedy sketch, a news report or an interview, I add it to a best of clip reel so I can easily find all the best excerpts for the documentary. But not everything can get in the final version. For 1937, I boiled 6.3 days of programming down to 27 hours of excerpts, from which a little under 5 hours made the final cut. And it seems like such a waste. Listening to these clip reels is one of my favorite parts of the process. I don't remember what I put on each reel, so it's one unexpected gem after another. And I want to share that experience with you. These excerpts are offered without commentary for your entertainment and education. So here are voices from 1937. Voices sadly now silenced. Great performers living again because you're listening to them now. The Jell-O program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston and Phil Harris and his orchestra. The orchestra opens the program with one in a million from the picture of the same name. But no getting down, we're still good friends and we have had a lot of fun, haven't we? Yes, sir, and I hope the new year will be just as pleasant. We certainly have had some great times together on this program. We sure have, Don. Laughing, talking, and cutting each other's throats. (laughs) Ah, but it was great fun. Come in. (laughs) Mr. Benny? Yes? I want to take this opportunity of wishing you and your company a very, very happy New Year. Well, and who are you? I'm fine, thank you. Goodbye. (laughs) Well, that's all right, then. Come in. (laughs) Mr. Benny? Yes? I want to take this opportunity of wishing you and your company a very, very happy New Year. Well, you said that before. Well, this time I mean it. Goodbye. (laughs) Oh, Jack, that reminds me of something. What? Here it is, 1937, and I forgot to write a poem about it. Oh, did you hear that, fellas? Oh. Did you hear that, audience? Oh. <laughs> oh, it's too bad, Mary. But I can have one in a minute. Is there a typewriter here? Uh, yes, right over there, Mary. Oh, well, go ahead and write one, Mary. Take about an hour on it. You know, we want a good poem. Don't worry. A Livingston always comes through. Hmm. Don't rush it, Mary. Don't rush it. While Mary is struggling with her latest brainchild, let me tell you about Jell-O. It's the most popular dessert on the market today because it's not only inexpensive but easy to make. It has that new extra-rich fresh fruit flavor. And remember... Oh, Don, not so loud. I'm trying to concentrate. Oh, pardon me, Mary. And remember, it comes in six delicious flavors. Strawberry, raspberry, cherry, orange, lemon, and lime. How are you coming along with your poem, Mary? Fine. Come in. Mr. Benny? Yes? I want to take this opportunity of wishing you and your company a very, very... Oh, you again. What are you whispering about? I'm ashamed to be on this program. (laughs) Well, I'm not. Play, Phil.
That was Under the Spell of the Voodoo Drums, played by the orchestra with Mary at the typewriter, and conducted by Phil Harris, who got my girl, but not my goat. <laughs> Phil, that was really beautiful. Yeah, wasn't she? I mean, the number you just played. Oh, that. Yeah. <laughs> what's, the, uh, what's the title of your poem, Mary? Oh, you 1937. <laughs> well, that, uh, that sounds promising. Go ahead. <clears throat> <clears throat> Uh, 1937, oh, 1937, where have you been all these years, and when did you leave heaven? Hmm, starting out good. Uh, what have you in store for us? What will the future be? For Jack and Phil and Kenny and Don, and me and me and me. You're a little selfish there, aren't you, Mary? Well, I wrote it. Oh, I see. Now, continue. Uh, will all the girls still like Phil Harris? Will Bucket catch his face? Who cares? Who cares? <laughs> Not me, or me, or me. Or me. Will Wilson do our advertising about that, you know, so appetizing? Mm. Will Jack another picture make? Or will they catch on that he's a fake? Don't be so critical. Uh, will our sponsor stay our friend? Or will this new year be the end? Mm. Uh, will Kenny's voice sound just as rich as in 1936? 1936? That. Sign that typewriter. Oh. So don't feel sad and don't feel blue. No. You'll get just what's coming to you. And happiness there sure will be for you and me and, and me, me and, and me. me. I knew that. Oh, you 1937? Well? That's all. I thank you. <laughs> That tone did show a little... Oh. oh, nurse. Nurse, what a bed. These are the worst springs I've ever seen. Well, the winners have been bad, too. <laughs> mm, fine nurse. Where's my horse? Right alongside of you. Oh, hello, partner. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Sounds, uh, sounds like a slight fever. <laughs> My deputy sheriff ain't been here yet, have they? Nope, but I guess they'll be along soon. Come in. Good morning, boys. Morning. morning. Give me a two-cent stamp and ice cream corn house, Buck. <laughs> here you are, here you are. Not so good. <laughs> thanks, thanks. Gee, that's too bad. <laughs> Cut the comedy, boys, and say hello to me. Hiya, Sheriff. Hiya, Sheriff. Hiya, Sheriff. Three smart girls. Oh, <laughs> uh, boys, any news on Cactus Face? Well, we were out looking for him this morning and found his clothes down by the riverbank. Hmm, he either committed suicide or took a bath. Most likely suicide. He ain't the bathing type. What'd you do with his suit? We're wearing it. <laughs> Well, boys, the next time you share a suit, you better find one with two pair of pants. <laughs> Deputy Baker, you're a disgrace running around like that. Oh! What's the matter, nurse? I just put my glasses on. <laughs> better scram, boys, especially you, Baker. Don't I get to talk about Jello? Not today, deputy. <laughs> so long. So long. long. How are you feeling now, Buck? Much better, nurse. I'm coming along fast. Well, slow down. I need the work. <laughs> Okay. Come in. Well, hello, Daisy. Hello, tall, dark, and dead looking. Well, gal, you don't exactly look like you ought to buy more than one dress at a time. <laughs> Some comeback, I'll say. Can the compliments, Buck. Here, I brought you a basket of fresh eggs. Thanks. <laughs> Now, wait a minute. There's no eggs in this basket. It's just your pet hen. Give her time, Buck. <laughs> well, Daisy, speaking of eggs, where's your pappy? He's down at Ike Muller's saloon getting boiled. Hmm. You know, Daisy, your pappy's going to get in trouble with his actions. I'm surprised someone ain't punched him in the nose. They can't. It's always behind a jug. <laughs> I believe he's got something there. 
What's the old rascal been doing lately? Well, the other night when he came home, he slid down the chimney. Oh, still playing Santa Claus, eh? Nope, he couldn't find the door. Well. <laughs> Here comes Pappy now. <laughs> well, he found that one. Hello, Frank. Hello, Buck. Seems kind of funny, you laying down and me standing up. <laughs> Nice rhythm there. Listen, Frank. <laughs> you put that gag over. What's the idea of crashing in here like that? Ain't you never been in a hospital before? Why, sure. I was here last fall to have my tonsils and pink elephants taken out. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah, the tonsils have gone permanent. <laughs> that's good. Uh, excuse me, folks, but i got to take the sheriff's temperature. Here, Buck, put this thermometer in your mouth. Chuck's nurse, those things are a fake. Ate three of them this morning. Didn't do me a bit of good. Well, you should have chewed them. Oh. I think you're running a little fever, Buck. <laughs> what are you laughing at, Daisy? Buck fever. <laughs> Daisy, you're plum giddy today. Who's there? That's the doctor. Well, come in. Hello, are you Buck Banny? That's me. Are you a doctor? I'm not offended, sir. <laughs> Here's my card. Physician, surgeon, and what my patients say about me is a lie. <laughs> you see that card. Hmm. Dr. C. F. Schmettina. M.D. Hmm? Well, what's the, uh, what's the M.D. for? Saddles. M.D. saddles, I see. <laughs> Well, I didn't know you were my doctor. I've been working on you every morning for a week. Oh, I thought you were making the bed. <laughs> What's really the matter with me, Doc? Well, my diagnosis is... Yes. You've got acute hemorrhabilia and cerebellar concussion. Mm, what does that mean, Doc? Oh, if I knew that, I could cure you. <laughs> mm, that's fine. Where is my medicine kit? Hmm, I must have left it someplace. I didn't see it. Well, open your mouth. Ah, uh, I thought so. What's the matter, Doc? It's nothing there. <laughs> now, Doc, quit fooling around. I got a broken neck. Bet a muffler. Who'll see it? <laughs> I don't need a muffler. I'm wearing a hospital nightgown. <laughs> now, let me feel your pulse, Poopsie. Give me your wrist. Yeah. Well, well. What's the matter, Doc? Can you stand a shock? Yes. You're dead. <laughs> Goodbye. Oh, doctor, wait for me. I want to ask you something. <clears throat> Say, Buck, didn't that doctor look familiar to you? Now that you mention it, Frank, he sure did. I think his beard was on a little crooked. What's the name on that card? Dr. C.F. Schmettiner. C.F. <laughs> that could be cactus face. Sure could. <laughs> oh, look, Buck, the doctor gave me this note right out of the building. He did? Let me see it. What does it say? Mm, dear ex-patient, if you are still alive when you read this, I hope you'll die from the shock. I am none other than Cactus Face Elmer. You were right, Frank. That was Cactus Face. And I'm going out to get him. You can't leave here, Sheriff. You're a sick man. I'm well enough now, and my duty comes first. And believe me, this time I'm going to bring him back. Send him back. I'm sick of you. How do you feel, partner? Hey, <laughs> let's go. Fox Benny rides again. What happened? Do you really want to know? Yes. Then tune in next Sunday night. Will Buck get cactus face? Will he have to pay for the window? Will it snow in New York? Will it rain in California? Be with us next Sunday night and you'll know. Play, boys. And even if I am a couple of days late, folks, on behalf of the members of the company myself, I want to wish all of you listeners a very happy and prosperous New Year. Oh, Mary. Yes? Uh, take a wire to Fred Allen, will you? Okay. Hey, dear Fred, I am not ashamed of myself. When I was ten years old, I could play Flight of the Bumblebee on my violin, too. Ah. You know how to spell, ah? Sign Jack Benny. This mystery will also be continued next week. Yes, good night, folks. <laughs> Thank you, Al-Al. Oh!
Pat C. Flick, who played the part of the doctor on this program, appeared through arrangement with Warner Brothers Studio. The tune of Pretty Girl is like a melody. It's from the great Zigfeld. The Jell-O program reaches you over the Red Network from the NBC studios in Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Ladies and gentlemen, the makers of Ipana for the smile of beauty and Sal Hepatica for the smile of health present It's Time to Smile! With Eddie Cantor! Chin. Let your troubles right from your private side through the country side, cross the great divide, push your cares aside, find the sunny side. Time to smile. And here he is, Eddie Cantor. Remember when we played in Bordable together? What pals we were? Yes, Eddie, put it there, old boy, real pals. Yes, indeed. And what an attraction we were, out in lights. It said Cantor and Jolson, huh? Yeah, Jolson and Cantor. <laughs> Cantor and Jolson. Jolson and Cantor. Look, Al, if you want to be a ham about this thing, if you want first billing, all right. Out in lights, it said Al Jolson. That's better. Of Cantor and Jolson. <laughs> <laughs> ah, but you were a terrific star. Al, you know that I was always influenced by the songs you sang? Really? Gosh, when you sang April Showers, I went out and got a raincoat. Hmm. When you sang California, Here I Come, I got a home in Beverly Hills. When you sang in my Merry Oldsmobile, I got a car. Hey, Eddie. <laughs> Didn't I used to sing Sonny Boy? <laughs> so long ago, who could remember? <laughs> but I do remember you and the jazz singer. Yes, Al. You came along with the jazz singer and started talking pictures. Yes, Eddie. Then you came along with 40 Little Mothers and finished them. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can't keep making smash hits. Even the greatest, most talented star in the world has made mistakes. Yes, I guess I have. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Go away, Al. But you've done so many things in show business, it's no wonder you've lost some of your energy. Eddie, what are you saying? Jolie has still got plenty of pep. Why, my last show, Hold On Your Hats, I sang ten songs. And for the big finish, I got down on my knee and I sang Mammy. What do you mean, got down? You fell down. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute, Eddie. Wait a minute, yeah. old boy. Let's not talk about me. Yeah. I came here to listen to you tell the folks about your 27 years of marriage, your honeymoon, your courtship, your wedding. Al, will you ever forget my wedding? It was beautiful, gosh. The whole place was decorated, and the flower girl. The little flower girl was so cute. Well, she... as far as that goes, May Robeson is still a cute little girl. <laughs> <laughs> Where did you go on your honeymoon, Eddie? Why, you know, we went to Niagara Falls. Oh, Niagara Falls. And say... You probably had to be careful how you spent your money in those days, Eddie. Well, who cared about money? All I was thinking of was Ida. I took her to the most expensive hotel in Niagara Falls, and we were so lovesick, Al. Yes. We, we spent half the night sitting in the lobby, necking. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> why, why didn't you go to your room? Who had a room? Oh. <laughs> Stop kidding, Eddie. Stop kidding. You did have a room. And that hotel in Niagara Falls still feels highly honored at having had you and Ida as a honeymoon guest. In fact... They still have the register that you signed. Mr. and Mrs. Eddie Cantor. They still have the key that opened the door to your bridal suite. And Eddie? Yes? They still have your baggage. <laughs> what? There's dew upon the ground And my the soul and time I'm walking by the river Cause I'm meeting someone there tonight I hear a distant sound I see a far off light I'm walking by the river Cause I'm meeting someone there the murmuring waters say there's no time to delay, so hurry on your way, my friend. If you don't get there soon, there may not be a moon to guide you to that happy ending. My is riding high My blues have taken flight I'm walking by 
by the river, cause I'm meeting someone there tonight. Walking by the river, walking by the river. The way, the way you sing. You know, you know, Harry, Dinah has an indescribable something in her voice. At the Met, they call it vibrato. In Tin Pan Alley, they call it schmaltz. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh, Eddie, how you talk. Well, Harry, I'm... Say, Eddie, that must have been some apartment. Well, of course, Harry, there were no modern improvements. No steam heat. No electricity. No telephone. No wonder, no Don Amici. <laughs> no radio. No radio. No radio? Calamity, catastrophe. No radio? What's the matter? Harry Von Zell, if they had no radio, how did people know about Sal Hepatica? Oh, how did they know about Sal Hepatica? Well, Eddie, one person told another what a good laxative Sal Hepatica is. As a matter of fact, they still do, but radio naturally does it a lot more quickly, which means a lot of more people benefit by knowing how much faster Sal Hepatica can help them feel better. For it's good to know, ladies and gentlemen, that whenever you need a laxative, speedy Sal Hepatica brings gentle relief usually within an hour. That means that you don't have to wait till night to take it. So it's not necessary to go through the day feeling miserable. And keep in mind, too, Sal Hepatica's added advantage. Sal Hepatica also helps counteract excess gastric acidity, helps turn a sour stomach sweet again. So get a bottle of Sal Hepatica from your druggist tomorrow. And whenever you need a laxative, morning, noon, or night, see how much faster you feel better when you take gentle, speedy Sal Hepatica. <laughs> Ida, sweet as apple cider, sweeter than all I know. Come on out in the silvery moonlight of love, I'll whisper so soft and low, soft and low. Seems though can't live without you. Listen. My honey do, 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 oh, I die, I, I like you, because I love you, I die, I do. You know, folks, the name Ida, that's more than just the name of Eddie's wife. It's something that stands for happiness. Yes, sir. A symbol of a successful married life. They've come a long way together, those two, since those days down on old Henry Street. But to him, she's still just as sweet, and her glance when they meet makes his heart skip a beat. Of course, a heart like Eddie's wants to save a beat every chance it gets. Oh, go away, will you? You know, I never got to meet Ida, that is, in those early days of their romance. You see, I had to stay home all alone by myself. <laughs> Because Tanner always borrows my pants. Who needs the man? But their love is deep as the ocean. Their hearts are filled with devotion. They equal the record of Mr. Dione, except in slow motion. It's no wonder, Ida. Daddy says, I love ya. Did I do? Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank Al Jolson for his graciousness in appearing here tonight and for turning over his check to Bundles for Britain. Yeah. Took one little break on New Year's Eve and passed out. Wasn't that funny, Jimmy? When I came to, I heard the waiter saying, 1937, Mr. Cantor. I said, Happy New Year to you, too. He said, No, 1937, that's your bill. Oh. <laughs> Jimmy, right now, I want you to help me dramatize some of the outstanding events of 1936. You and I, Jimmy Wallington, will impersonate all the principal characters. Let's go. The greatest mistake that was made during the year 1936, 35, 34, and back to 70, 76, was made in a poll conducted by the Literary Digest. James Wallington interviews the gentleman in charge of the poll. 
I came here for an interview. In speaking to you, Mr. Wallington, the world's greatest radio announcer. How do you like that? Still making mistakes. Get out of here. We take you to Calendar, Ontario, where the most widely advertised baby speaks to you in person. Yvonne. Hello. Emily. Hello. Annette. Hello, sticky, 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 sticky. Cecile. Hello, madame, monsieur. Marie. Come on, Marie, say something, will you? Marie, come on, say something. Now, Marie, come up here and say something. No, I ain't been paid for yesterday. <laughs> In the world of sports, Jesse Owens was the athletic hero of 1936. We interview Jesse Owens. Mr. Owens? What is the fastest thing you've ever done? Well, you know the super chief train on the Santa Fe? Yes. Well, I raced that train from Chicago to California. And what happened? I beat the train by 10 hours. 10 hours? Marvelous. I would have beaten it by 12 hours, but I stopped off at Albuquerque to help an Indian who was in trouble. Now, uh, what did you do for the Indian? I gave him some fire chief gasoline. Fire chief gasoline? Yeah, that's the best thing for engine trouble. <laughs> The greatest event in radio during 1936 happened on Sunday night, September the 27th. Eddie Cantor did not mention Ida and the five girls. <laughs> the Associated Press interviews the screen sensation of the year, Robert Taylor. <clears throat> now, Mr. Taylor, to whom do you attribute all your success? To the ladies. Ah, a lady, Taylor. Oh. <laughs> Tell me, Mr. Taylor, is there any particular lady... To whom you show a preference? Uh, whom do you mean? Well, Miss Barbara Stanwyck. Please don't mention any names. All right, I won't mention Barbara Stanwyck. Oh, no, no. <laughs> no, don't do it. Now tell me, did, uh, did you wear your hair this long for the picture, Camille? Yes. Well, don't you think it's about time you saw a barber? Uh, a please, barber? please, please, please. Don't mention Miss Stanwyck's no, name, I, I said. I won't mention. Look at the man. Look don't at the man. <laughs> Look, at, on the estate of Leo Carrillo last Sunday, you had a lot of fun with broiling steaks and chops. Oh, it was delightful. For sort of a barber. Oh, please, 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 I ask you not to mention her name. Well, right. Mr. Taylor, look, I'm going to ask you to demonstrate your method of hugging the female stars with whom you appear in pictures. I'll play one of your female stars. Do you want it? Do you want it, James? You are, go ahead, you're Taylor, go ahead. All right. What do you do? Well, I usually put my right arm around them like this. Yes. With my hand in the small of their back, just like this. Go on, I love it. Go on, go on, go on. Then, then I put my left arm around their neck. So, oh, Mr. Taylor, you're so barbarous. Oh, I, I can't stand with this. Uh, 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 now, now, now. Then what do you do? And then, then I press. Them. Yes. And press. Yes. And press. Oh, now you're a real Taylor. <laughs> and then, yes, the final embrace, like this. Oh, 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 Jimmy. Oh. Now then, Taylor. what do you think that does to them? I don't know what it does to them. Look, but it broke, it broke three of my best cigars. Get out of here. <laughs> The old year is gone and the new year is on and I'm wishing you wonderful things. Each letter you send makes me feel you're my friend. I can't tell you the joy that it brings. So keep writing me once in a while and I'll answer by making you smile. Oh, New Year's Eve horns were blowing and champagne was flowing. Jimmy Wallington acted the clown. I know one certain smarty who paid for the party. Who? The mayor of Texaco Town. New Year's Day at the Rose Bowl. East and West play their football. The Pittsburgh team won it hands down. They took one private lesson from a man now start guessing. Who? The mayor of Texaco Town. One night for a pastime, I played for the last time that strip poker game of renown for a couple of Mondays who stayed home in his undies. <gasps> the mayor of Texaco Town. Eddie, yeah, I want to ask you something. You know, there are many people who have never heard you sing my song, Mammy. You know, they might enjoy hearing Tanner doing a joke, and how about it? Okay, Renard, one chorus of Mammy and E-flat. <laughs> Mammy, 
mammy. The sun shines east, the sun shines west, but I know where the sun shines best. Mammy, mammy, my heart strings are tangled around Alabama. Eyes are coming. Sorry that I made you wait. Eyes are coming. Hope and pray I'm not too late. My darling, mammy, mammy, I'd walk a million miles for one of your smiles. You know, I believe that there might be a few people who would like to hear Jolson doing a canter. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Slim Renard, give me Margie in any flat. <laughs> Margie, I'm always thinking of you, Margie. I'll tell the world I love you. Don't forget your promise to me. Cause I have bought the home and ring and everything for Margie. You've been my inspiration, days are never blue. And after all is said and done, there is really only one for oh, Margie. Margie. Yeah. Al, Al, I want to tell you that was grand, huh? Now, why don't we harmonize to the tune of good old Dinah? Renard, let's have it. Dinah, is there, there anyone finer in the state of Carolina? Is there, there is a new know-how blowing a me or Dinah? With your dixie eyes blazing, I will not to sit and gaze in. To the eyes of Dinah Lee. Every night, wine, wine, cake with fright. Because my dynamite change your mind about if they do that dance in heaven, shoot me hunting night or seven I'll give us a piece of pie. Oh, Dinah, if you want to do Dinah, I would hop on the line. That's the evil Dinah Columbia Broadcasting System. This is KNX Los Angeles, the voice of Hollywood. Five seconds until 8.30 p.m. B-U-L-O-V-A, Boulevard Watch Time. Hollywood, California, Monday, January 4th. <laughs> the Lux Radio Theater presents Spencer Tracy, Virginia Bruce, and Francis Farmer in Men in White with Frank Riker and Paul Gilfoyle. <laughs> Lux presents Hollywood. Our stars, Spencer Tracy, Virginia Bruce, Francis Farmer, Frank Riker, and Paul Gilfoyle. Our guests, Dr. Frank G. Heiser, distinguished physician and author of An American Doctor's Odyssey and Miss Edith Head, motion picture dress designer. Our producer, Cecil B. DeMille, whose picture The Plainsman is playing this week in principal cities throughout the country. Our conductor, Louis Silvers. The makers of Lux Flakes greet you with best wishes for the new year and a cordial invitation to be with us each Monday night through 1937. Welcome, everyone. Men in White, starring Spencer Tracy, Virginia Bruce, and Francis Farmer, continues shortly. Twelve years ago, a young lady whom I recognized as a teacher at the Hollywood School for Girls, where my two daughters were students, walked on my set at Paramount. I ventured to ask what new mischief those two DeMille kids had been up to. Oh, the girls are fine, I was told. 
I'm here to go to work. You see, Mr. DeMille, I've just been hired as your new wardrobe designer. So a school mom turned into one of Paramount's cleverest creators of costumes. Her name is one you've seen many times on the screen. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Edith Head. Thank you. You've been listening to a play about men in white, ladies and gentlemen. Here's something that may interest you about women in white. Women in white are very rarely seen in films because pure white is one of the most difficult colors to photograph. But in Jack Benny's new picture, College Holiday, you'll see a big dance number in which pure white is successfully screened. It's a, it's a dance that starts off with a Grecian ballet. That calls for a background of white Grecian temples, white statues, warriors in white armor, and 60 girls in white wigs and immaculate white dresses. That we succeeded in filming this all-white sequence is due in no small measure to Lux Flakes. Every night, the costumes worn by Gracie Allen, Martha Ray, Mary Bulland, along with those of the chorus, were laundered in Lux. Each morning, they appeared as immaculately white as the snow which we never see in Hollywood. And though they were washed at least a dozen times before the scene was finished, you can see them now in our wardrobe, looking just as lovely and new as the day the dressmakers finished them. We'll be using lots of Lux Flakes, too, in making our new film, Waikiki Wedding, in which Bing Crosby and Bob Burns are starred. Since it's late in Hawaii, white summery costumes will predominate. And incidentally, in this picture, for the first time in my life, I had to design a costume for a pig. I mean, a real pig. Thank you. Good night. <laughs> Good night. Back to Men in White, starring Spencer Tracy, Virginia Bruce, and Francis Farmer. And now, ladies and gentlemen, our stars in alphabetical order. Miss Bruce, Miss Farmer, and Mr. Tracy. I have just two things on my mind, Mr. DeMille. First, I want to wish everyone a very happy new year. And second, I want to say this. Every Monday night, I've heard the stars get up here and say how much they enjoyed being on the Lux program. Well, now I know they weren't just being polite. It's been a grand experience, and many thanks. I surrender the microphone to my alphabetical neighbor, Miss Frances Palmer. As a comparative newcomer to Hollywood, Mr. DeMille, I'm afraid I am not any source of news... I've worked rather hard these past months, but nothing could have pleased me more. It's met the fulfillment of my earliest ambitions, a chance to act. To pictures, to the people who attend them, and to the Lux Radio Theater, my sincere thanks. And now, our man in white, Spencer Tracy. Thank you. I owe a lot to Hollywood, Mr. DeMille. But having spent so many years on the stage, I admit I've been lonesome more than once for the legitimate theater. Tonight, you've given me the opportunity to get back again behind the footlights, and I'm very grateful. But Men in White does a great deal more than satisfy an actor's ego. It's an enduring tribute to what I feel is the finest profession in the world. You hear a lot these days about commercialism. People wonder what's happened to the humanity and the sacrifice that glorified the past. It's still around us, in the men in white of your hometown and mine. Men whose sole objective in life is that we might be well. And I hope that tonight we have succeeded in reflecting upon the family physician a little of the honor which, along with our bills, we may have forgotten to pay him. Good night. Thou who hast endowed us with marvelous faculties of mind and soul, let in a flood of light upon the deeper meaning of our high calling. Crown us with zeal, with courage, and fidelity, that we may be in the company of those immortals who live in human lives made better. Forgive, O oh Lord, our selfish joys and our selfish sorrows, and may we consecrate our best selves to everything that is worthy. We most fervently pray that our president may be attended by thy mercy, truth, and grace. Let thy spirit come mightily with rich blessings upon our speaker and upon every member of this Congress, that they may be guided by the very highest conceptions of right and duty. O oh Lord God of hosts, speak thou to the nations 
in thy sore displeasure. Stay thou the blows and the flames that fill the cup of the world's sufferings. Come thou to our own beloved land with a new voice, with a much needed accent, until there is a tremendous surging of peace and brotherhood at the very soul of our republic. Make it rich in happy homes, wise statesmanship, and in an abounding faith in an infinite God, our Father, and in Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Our NBC microphones have been placed on the white marble speaker's desk, on the reading clerk's desk, and in the well of the house that you may hear the remarks of the individual members. Over those microphones, you've heard them answering to their names as they were called during the roll call. Microphones have also been placed on the committee tables of the majority and minority leaders, which serve as focal points for the important work done on the floor of the House. Last year, the President of the United States addressed the Joint Congress on the opening day, or at night, as you'll probably recall. But due to the additional work required of the House in organizing itself this year, the President will wait until tomorrow afternoon to give his report on the State of the Union and to make his recommendations for legislation which he believed to be necessary. His address will be broadcast in full over the combined networks of the National Broadcasting Company. It seems that all of the lady members of the House are dressed in black today. We see Mrs. Caroline O'Day just beginning her second term in Congress. And Mrs. Nan W. Honeyman, the new member from Oregon. And Mrs. Edith North, Nurse Rogers, the only Republican woman member of Congress, seated over on our side of the House chamber with her Republican colleagues, also with an orchid today. And Mrs. Virginia Jenks, a member of Congress from Indiana, dressed in black with a very lovely corsage of gardenias, shoulder corsage. The gentleman who's going to preside over the House during the 75th Congress is the Honorable William B. Bankhead illustrious member of Congress from Alabama. He's been a member of the House for 20 years and served as Speaker during the closing weeks of the last session, having been unanimously elected to succeed the late Speaker Burns, who died very suddenly during the session. Representative Bankhead was chosen by his party in their secret caucus yesterday afternoon to be its candidate for presiding officer. And with the enormous majority now held in the House by the Democratic Party, his election is a certainty. At the present time, he's seated over on the Democratic side of the House, right near some of the other Democratic leaders at the table of the majority leader. The Republicans are expected to nominate the Honorable Bertrand H. Snell, member of Congress from New York, and for many years the minority floor leader, to be their candidate for Speaker of the House. And for the office of Speaker, the former Labor Party and the progressives in the House will present as their coalition candidate the Honorable George J. Schneider, progressive member of Congress from Wisconsin. It's about six months since Congress adjourned, but now it's a new year, a new Congress, and time to start carrying out the wishes of the constituents back home in enacting new legislation. Our broadcast continues from the floor of the House of Representatives coming to you through the National Broadcasting Company, and you're going to hear now the roll call of the House of Representatives on the election of Speaker. The National Broadcasting Company is broadcasting to its nationwide radio audience the opening proceedings of the 75th Congress direct from the floor of the House of Representatives in Washington, D.C. Mr. A.E. Chaffee, reading clerk of the House, has just called the roll of the House on the election of a speaker to preside over the House of Representatives during the coming two years, the 75th session of Congress. He is now recalling the names of those who did not answer to the first roll call. We return you to the reading clerk, who is situated just below and in front of the speaker's desk for the recalling of the names of the absentees in the chamber this morning. Goodwin. Griswold. Griswold, the bank head. Okay. The Bakers 
of Campbell's Soup present George Burns and Tracy Allen. And Henry King and his music. From the Louis Pond picture, that girl from Paris, Henry King and his orchestra are playing Love and Learn. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy New Year. Yes. Hello. Hello. Oh, boys, you certainly missed it. Did we have fun New Year's Eve, did we? Mm. Well, we had more fun than a barrel of monkeys. Uh, uh, a barrel of monkeys? Yes. Tracy, you mean a barrel of monkeys. Continue. Well, that's what I said, a barrel of monkeys. Well, for a minute, I thought you were wrong. Yeah. No matter. <laughs> well, anywho, I was with a party, and they were dancing, and everybody was good to the stills. Good to the stills? Yes. Good and... to the gills. You mean they were petrified? Petrified. I mean petrified. You've got me silly now. Yeah, now. And I... <laughs> now, eh? Well, all right, so you had a good time. Good time? Well, I was with a party of... Five? Yeah, well, that is, he'll be 85 in April. <laughs> so... Now, because the prunes were stewed, too. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't get it. <laughs> Well, I don't either. And you know, George, my granddaddy is so old that instead of searching for the drinks, he drinks for the shakes. He's probably an old rumba dancer. Mm. Hey, the real. Uh, and uh. so, when we got home, my grandmother looked at my granddaddy and said, Hal, where have you been, Hal? Hal? The kid's name is Hal? Yeah, well, of course, he only calls him Hal for short. His whole name is Alcahal. Oh, Alcahal, yeah. Yes, yes Alcahal. So your grandmother asked your granddaddy where he'd been. Yes, and he didn't answer. He, didn't. he just fell down the stairs with two quarts of liquor. That's right. And did he spill the liquor? No, no, he kept his mouth closed. <laughs> and Henry, what did you do New Year? Well, I went fishing through the ice. Fishing through the ice. Well, that's a nice way of spending New Year. Yeah. I fished through the ice for 20 minutes until I got that cherry in the bottom of the glass. <laughs> <laughs> and very good, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And Tony, what did you do for New Year's? Well, George, I went out New Year's Eve. You know, I was a little homesick. I didn't have a drink. Well, now, I'm glad to hear that, Tony. And a pair of lips that touch liquor will never touch mine. That's right. Your lips. Yeah, my liquor. <laughs> Tony, in case you should have any trouble with Gracie tonight, just call on me. Oh, don't worry about me, George. Gracie's putty in my hand. Oh, thanks, Tony. And I think you're putty, too. All right. <laughs> putty, putty. Well, Tony, I think there should be a wire for you. Yeah. Oh, King, have you got a wire? Oh, yeah. Yes, Tony, oh, there's a wire for you. you. <laughs> I'm sorry, it was my line. I said. Oh, George, you're lying. Oh, I don't it. Thank you, Henry. Oh. Keep this up and I'll put you both back in the trunk. No, Excuse me a minute, George. Oh, yes, the wire. Oh, Come on, Tony, what's in the wire? wire? Well, uh, what do you think I am? A gentleman never reveals confidences. Things like this are sacred. There's nothing in the wire, George. It's from Alice Fay, and she says she'll never meet her Tony Woney at the Twainy Waney when he arrives in Hollywood, and she signs it Fazy Wazy. Oh, I see. Double talk Fazy Wazy, eh? Isn't that pretty? You know, George, every woman starts to talk baby talk when she's old enough. Mm, I get it. 
Stacy, why don't you make a resolution to manage your own business, and Henry, Tony, and I will manage to have a good time? Well, I did make a resolution. I made a resolution that now Tony Martin can't even kiss me after he's off the program. Okay. Tony Martin has never even tried to kiss you while he's on this program. And why do you think he's going off this program? <laughs> I can't imagine, but I know it isn't Alice Faye. Oh, no, but he can come back sometime. When? When Faye is gone and shut When Faye is gone, quiet, quiet. In other words, no kissy, no working. That's right, no necky, no checky. No necky, no checky. Uh, Gracie, Tony Martin can't kiss you or he'd be breaking your resolution. Well, he doesn't have to hold me that tight, does he? Love must be a marvelous thing. Yes, I've heard very highly spoken of. Oh, yeah, that stuff gets around. Yeah. Before this goes too far, I think I'd better confess. I sent the wire for a rib. Why not a check? Mm -hmm. Gracie, this whole story came out of my head, and there's absolutely nothing in it. Oh, Henry, you're just self conscious. <laughs> Well, Ken Roberts, the only one on this program Gracie hasn't picked on is you. Well, yeah. George, now isn't that the cooler? Oh, yes, it's quite the cooler, yeah. Our announcer here in New York is Ken Roberts, and our announcer in California is Ken Niles. Yeah, Ken Roberts and Ken Niles. Two Ken. Well, sure. You know, with Campbell's chicken soup, even their announcers have to come in Ken. <laughs> Tell me the song. Uh, well, uh, Gracie, how does New York look to you after being away nearly a year? Well, I've never seen any place so changed. The last time we were here, it was Tuesday and now it's Wednesday. I say, it's never Tuesday on a Wednesday. Oh, no, George, even when you're right, you sound silly. I, I sound silly, huh? But then again, sometimes you don't, and then again, I wouldn't think of it. Sometimes I don't, and then again, you wouldn't think of it. Yeah, because after all, it's more important to anybody than just to other people, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I know what you mean. Gracie, do you know what you're talking about? Oh, thanks, George. I'm glad you understand. Listen, one of these days, you're going to go with me to a brain specialist. Oh, Freddy Cat, scared to go alone, huh? <laughs> if I had the teeny-weeny brain that you have... You'd at least have a teeny-weeny brain. Um, <laughs> Talking to you is like talking to a moving picture dummy. Now, you've got no right to call him a moving picture dummy just because he makes love to Alice Faye. I say. Thanks, Gracie. <laughs> You're welcome, Tony. Mm. Hey, Tony, how are you enjoying your first visit to New York City? Fine, Henry. Say, you remember that girl, Constance Wilson, that Alice Faye wished to take care of me? Uh-huh. Well, mm. she took me sightseeing. Have you seen the Empire State Building, the Aquarium, Grant's Tomb, and Old Point? No, Park? but I saw Milgram's today. You did? Oh, well, now, I think it's silly to visit those foolish places like Central Park and the Bronx Zoo and the Metropolitan Museum of Art and Radio City when you can go sightseeing in a dress shop like Milgram. I think you've got something. Oh, you should have seen Constance when I bought her that mink coat. Uh, you... She was like a kid with a new toy. You bought her a mink coat? Yeah. Henry, did I you? heard he bought her a mink coat. Ken. I know. He bought her a mink coat. You 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 bought her a mink coat and you only know her a week? Oh, sure. You don't think Tony would buy mink coats for strangers, do you? <laughs> well, now I feel better. Of course, I didn't just buy it for concert. Oh, no. You knew it would make Alice say happy. Mm. Sure. She's Alice's girlfriend. Well, I know how you feel, Tony. Any friend of Alice's is a mink coat from you. Mm. <laughs> you said it, Chrissy. Say... We oh. need a mink coat. Look who's coming. Oh, hello, Tony boy. Hello, Connie. How do you do, Miss Allen? Well, I don't do as well as you do. It's coming. It's coming. I, um, I hear you've been minking this afternoon. Oh, Tony, that coat is beautiful. And I adore those dresses and shoes. Oh, so you've been shoeing and dressing, too. Did you do any hatting and gloving? <laughs> You know, Miss Wilson, Alice Faye is a very lucky person to have a girlfriend like you that Tony can buy things for. Oh, I hated to have him spend so much money on me. Oh, but if it makes Tony happy, who are you to deny him any pleasure? Yes. <laughs> well, that's just what I said to myself. Constance, you mustn't be selfish. Oh, you know, Tony, I think you ought to buy Constance an automobile. You owe it to Alice. <laughs> Uh, now, don't get sarcastic, Gracie. Uh, Miss, uh, Miss Wilson has meant a lot to Tony. Thanks, George. Yes, he came to New York a stranger. Now, I took him to Milgram's, and I took him to Saks Avenue, and I took him to Tiffany. Oh, I can see you certainly took him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
I think Miss Wil- Miss Wilson has done a lot, a lot of good for Tony. Well, nobody could have done any more good for him. Oh, sure, sure. <laughs> Outside of May West. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm thinking. My mind is in Egypt tonight. Mm-hmm. You're not telling me. Yes, <laughs> I'm thinking very seriously of letting Tony take me to Hollywood. I might go into moving pictures. Oh, well, now it would be foolish to go all the way to Hollywood. You could see the same pictures here in New York. Well, that's nice. <laughs> well Gracie, cops have heard of a part of Paramount, and my agent might be able to get it for her. What kind of a part is it? Well, it's the part of a young girl who... Oh, but why should I talk about it? I'm probably too late for it now. Yeah, about 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to see you get it, Connie. The part of a sweet, young, innocent... Oh, don't be girl. silly, Tony. Miss Wilson doesn't want to play character parts. Mm. <laughs> Wait, are you trying to insult Miss Wilson? I'm not even trying. I can see that, yes. Oh, uh, have you know that the only reason I took Tony Martin into Milgram's is because he wanted to use the telephone. Oh, now I understand. And, and he was ashamed to come out without buying anything, so he bought you a mink coat. <laughs> Gracie, will you stop making a fuss over a measly $5,000? Listen to me, Gracie Allen. If I had that mink coat here now, I'd throw it right at you. What size is it? Uh, what size is it? I just did what Tony told me to do. He told me to pick out a coat to match my personality. Oh, and they were all out of weasel, huh? <laughs> Because we're leaving for Hollywood tomorrow, and the people of New York have been so nice to me, I'm going to leave my recipe on how to make a Hollywood sweetie pie. A Hollywood sweetie pie? Yes. Well, that ought to be interesting, and I know that they'll admire your crust. Oh, please, God. A recipe. Yes. Now, first, take a couple of berries. Blueberries or blackberries? Oh, no, raspberries. Oh, raspberries, the big ones, yes, yes, yes. Now, uh, have you got two bowls, Tony? Two bowls? Yes. yes. Well, use a good-looking one. Which one is that? John. John Bowl. That's that big bowl. Yes. 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 And then you add a wrap with spice. I uh, know wrap, but who's spice? A ginger. Oh, yes, ginger. But ginger. not too much ginger. It'll give you a thing. I get it, and I suppose if you haven't got enough, you can always, uh, bury more? Oh, uh-huh. good, nice, nice, big, more power to you. Thanks, thanks. Then? Yes, what do you do then? Then you add a little better work. Just to trace it? Yes. I see. Then you light the stove, and you put the pie in the Oberon. In the Oberon, yes. But uh, don't let it stand with overnight. Don't let it stand with overnight. This is really an easy recipe. Oh, well, it's not a hardy. A hardy. I get it, yes, yes. Now, uh, the trick is to let it simmer twice. The trick is to let it simmer twice? Yes, simmer, simmer. <laughs> and, uh, and is it good? Is it good? Oh, boy, yeah. Oh, boy, yeah. Well, I think we've had it. Look, I think somebody wants to see you. There's a guy standing outside. Guy standing? I'm going to have trouble with you, too. Well, is he tall and handsome? Has he got beautiful eyes and an adorable face and a kissable mouth? Oh, no. Well, then tell, tell him I don't want him. I say, I'll tell him, Gracie, when he comes in. Hmm. Gracie, every man isn't tall and handsome. Once in a while, you run across a man who's dull and homeless. Oh, George, you must get over that inferiority complex. <laughs> well, I'll do my best. Uh, I'm from Milton. Department. I'm here to check up on an account that was opened by Mr. Tony Martin. Mm-hmm. He gave your name as reference. Oh, sure. You don't have to worry about him. Oh, thank you. Because we're deli- to deliver a mink coat and dresses to a Miss Constance Wilson, and I thought that if you... Oh, were... Tony Martin. Yes. Hey, George, was he fired last week or the week before? Let's see. Tony Martin just got through singing your song. Oh, you see, mister, I told you he was through. Mm-hmm. Oh, George, will you help me out? Well, okay, uh, listen, mister, this is just a love of squirrel. You see, Miss Allen wants Mr. Martin to kiss her, and because he refuses to kiss her... I'm only a credit man. I'm not interested in kissing. Uh, well, I'm not either. Well, I am. Mm-hmm. Gracie, I'll kiss you. I say. Mm. This is our Mr. King who wants to be kissed. Uh, mister, have you any objections to kissing? Oh, I, uh, no. Well, good. Then you kiss Mr. King, and I'll devote all my time to Tony. Mm. <laughs> Gracie, I think you've got something there. Mm. Kiss Mr. King. 
Say, I'm a credit man from Milgo's, and I'm not kissing a man. Are you insinuating Henry King is my man? Mm. <laughs> Henry, why did you stop it? Well, I just said I'd kiss Gracie and... Quiet. Quiet. <laughs> had enough of me, but I'm from Tiffany Jewelry Store. Oh, well, then you kiss him. <laughs> uh, what is it, mister? Uh, Tony Martin gave a Gracie Allen as reference and bought a diamond ring from her. So Tony also bought Constance Ring a diamond watch? No, oh, nuts. Here I am talking like a fool. Oh, well, uh, George, I'm glad to see that you're your old self again. Yes. Yeah. I bought Constance a diamond ring because she wanted something to go with a mink coat. Is his credit okay, Miss Allen? Oh, certainly. It won't take him long to find another job. Yeah. Hey, there's a chance of us not getting our money. Then we'd better not recommend the account. Yeah? I always take care of my business obligations. Tony, why don't you kiss her and get it over with? That's my business. Well, then stop neglecting your business. I think so, too. If I want to give Constance Wilson a mink coat and a diamond ring, that's my affair. And who's going to stop me? We are. <laughs> Listen, boys, you've got them all wrong. Here's now, a telegram for you, Tony. That's probably another one of Henry's jokes. Give it to George. Wait a minute. Henry, this is really from Hollywood. Listen to this. Dear Tony, I'm listening to your broadcast, and I don't know any Constance Wilson... And didn't tell anybody to look you up. The woman is an imposter. Signed, Alice Fay. What? Oh, just as I thought that Wilson girl is nothing but a gold diggle and a cook. Three people are. Let's see that. Mm. Well, I guess you're right, Gracie. Mm. You've got to be thankful, Tony. Gracie saved you a lot of money. Oh, well, I was glad to do it. If there's anything I hate, it's a gold digger. How any woman can take mink coats and diamonds from a man, I can't understand. Mm. Gracie, I, I know you saved me a lot of money, and to show you my appreciation, I'd like to give you a little gift. Oh, forget it, Tony. Don't be silly. That's all right, Gracie. You saved him a mink coat and diamond ring. If he wants to show his appreciation by giving you a little gift, let him do it. Oh, all right, Tony. If it'll make you happy. Oh, right, that's swell, Gracie. Now, what would you like me to give you? Oh, I know. Uh, just a mink coat and a diamond ring. Yeah, Henry, I knew that. <laughs> Thanks for listening to 1937 Part 1, the Soundscapes Audio Montage Series Number 10, When Radio Ruled. I'm Mike Gillette, your host. When Radio Ruled and the Soundscape Series are before TV productions. Copyright 2021.